except now I started when I was 60. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to call a meeting to order at this time. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. See, I waited for it this time. I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, I don't know if it was on. We got to do it all again. It was off before. <laughs> we don't. Uh, let the record show that all members of council are present this evening. Yes, Mayor, I will. And we're going to open up with our reports. And I'll open up with, with a report uh, I attended this morning's um, Transportation Planning Agency meeting. A couple items that uh, were covered there. One was, and I think this is interesting, there's going to be a survey done by Palm Tran looking at the possibility of an express bus service between Port St. Lucie and West Palm Beach. Um, I happen to know personally there are a lot of, we have students who go to school down here coming all the way down from Port St. Lucie. We have some people who live up there, but they work down here. So maybe there's some merit to that being considered. But anytime we think about express bus services anywhere, I'm, I get excited because we're moving we're moving in the right direction, right, to, to get to where we need to get to with public transportation. Um, I also wanted to share with you that the month of May is, is National Bike Month. Um, I don't know if you do anything with bikes, but think about maybe trying to do something. There are different events that are going on. I know we have some events in the village and in the surrounding area, so if you want to get uh, to be part of National Bike Month, you know, maybe you might want to participate and, and get involved with some of those activities. We had an uh, update to our TIP, uh, the Transportation Improvement Plan. That's our five-year plan that we update periodically to add some um, projects to it. The projects they added uh, don't really affect our area. They were more in uh, the West Palm Beach, Green Acres area. Then we had a very interesting discussion about uh, performance measurements for bridges and roads uh, on the, on the uh, state level and then more on a, a local level for Palm Beach County. And the bottom line is, uh, on a county level, we are looking to achieve a higher level of, of uh, proficiency and, and standards for our bridges and, 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 and highways. And we will be having some workshops down the road to, to kind of look at that over and above what we believe where the state levels are. So we had quite a bit of discussion about that. So with that, I think we're going to start with you, Sonia. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we hosted, the village hosted the Palm Beach County League of Cities monthly luncheon. So thank you very much to the staff for putting that on. So they serve everybody. They, um, they really take care of us or for the event. So thank you for that. Uh, we all attended our strategic planning session that we do annually. And it, a lot of great information came out of that. Um, we do have our citizen summit, which is open to the public. So please come Thursday, the 27th of April from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. over at the Cultural Center. So all the information's on our website, and that's open to the public. And there's usually coffee and cookies, so remember that. If anything, come for that. Uh, the young you said the 27th of April. 27th of April. That's next yeah, week. next Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, young at Heart had their monthly luncheon, and the uh, music theme was Calypso and Soca music, so it was really nice that everyone got up and was dancing there. We had multi-generations on the dance floor this time. Uh, tomorrow, the 14th, the 21st, I'm sorry, we have the Rolling Stones Tribute Band over at Commons Park, and that's from 7 to 9. And the next two Saturdays are the last two Saturdays of our green market for the season, so the 22nd and 29th of April, right out front here from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. are the uh, it. so at the end of April, we're done. Um, we, I attended the Palm Beach County Commission on Affordable Housing. So it was an interesting conversation. Uh, everyone talks about workforce housing. Um, affordability, supply, demand, things like that. So um, my one takeaway from it was uh, <laughs> increased density was, was what they basically said. Just start building and building and building, and eventually we'll catch up. 
So I was a little discouraged to hear that, but um, that was that was one of the things I got out of that. Uh, and not to steal your thunder on uh, FAU Commissioner Valentes, but I'll let you talk about that. So I'm going to say congratulations uh, to the University of Miami men's and women's basketball team. So men went to the Final Four, women went to the Elite Eight. And congratulations to um, Chief Romero, who is here. She's with district. She's the new district chief for just uh, fire. She's, she's going to be introduced. Oh, she is? Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'm not going to steal that. So okay. that completes my report. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Well, since Alina brought it up, I'll say the uh, FAU uh, Fighting Owls uh, got to the final four and lost by what, one point. Yeah. A little, little less than Miami, but... Uh, my son goes down there, so he's been extremely involved in But they had a great season, and it was great to see two Florida teams in the Final Four. Um, and I was happy to hear, Mr. Mayor, you said, uh, it's funny, I, I have two people in my office who live up live in up Port there, yeah. St. Lucie, yeah. and they drive down to West Palm Beach. And, I mean, at least they're smart about it. Like, they come in crazy early <laughs> to not <laughs> deal with the traffic. The traffic. Yeah. Exactly, and they and yeah. they get to leave a little earlier. But that that's – a good option because it seems a lot more people are moving up to Martin and St. Lucie County. And if the jobs like here, a lot of people like me head east to go to work. Yeah. If uh, there's a better alternative for them than, you know, driving their car, what is it, at least 60 miles one way to, to get to work. It's a hike every day. That would that be every uh, day, two times. That's, so, if it, listen, the whole concept um, from a county perspective is we've been talking about. Whenever I'm asked a question or I get the complaint from citizens about the traffic, I say, yeah, you're right. It's bad, and it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And, but then I say, but the way we can address it is to create enough public transportation infrastructure and capability that you truly have an option of saying, I don't need to take my car to get to where I want to go. Now, we're a long ways from getting there, but that's the direction that we have to try to move in. And maybe this is a step. At least a, from a thinking process. So I hope so. At least, yeah, it seems to be a good idea to me. But yeah. okay. that's it. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Jeff. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this past, um, let's see, it was two weeks ago, actually, on uh, Friday, April the 7th, uh, the Royal Palm Beach High School Navy Junior ROTC had what they call their annual military ball. Mm. And um, this was the second one that um, my wife, Carolyn, and I attended. And I'll tell you, they are clearly becoming more and more um, professional in the way that they conduct themselves uh, to the point that, honestly, if I didn't realize this was a junior ROTC, I would assume it was at least an ROTC, if not an active duty uh, presentation. They had formal dress. They, they wore the uniforms. And uh, I, guess, I guess the uh, young women were given the option of wearing a gown. And all of the gowns were red. So it was pretty spectacular. It really was. And uh, most impressive, like I said, was they ran. Uh, the cadets ran the entire event, uh, the ceremony, right from the presentation of colors all the way through to the presentation of individual awards. Just remarkably well done, very impressive. That whole program has suffered some bumps and bruises here and there, but it's now, I think, in its fifth year. And under the current leadership, which is uh, Navy Chief uh, Sergio Sandoval, uh, they've done some remarkable things in the last three years. So they're up to about 100 cadets right now, over 100 cadets. Uh, they're out there recruiting heavily. So next year, there will probably be even more. And just as uh, important is they will be picking up an additional senior, uh, I think they call it Naval Science. I'm Army, so what do I know about that? Naval Science Instructor. And, um, and so that program is growing. It, it really is. In fact, they're talking about competing uh, regionally uh, in a competition up at the uh, Navy SEAL Museum. If you've ever been there, you know there's an obstacle course, which is kind of an interesting experience to play around with. So they're really into it. They're doing some great things over there, and they're having a big impact on Royal Palm Beach High School. So congratulations to the chief and uh, to all of the, the students. Oh, one other thing. So this, I think, is a, at least the first year I'm aware of it. Uh, one of the cadets uh, has been accepted at the Naval Academy. So, wow, uh, that's yeah, nice. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So congratulations again to Royal Palm Beach High School. Um, speaking of transit, transportation, how can you have a conversation if you're not going to talk about housing, then you're going to talk about transportation and vice versa? So um, we had an opportunity for a group of uh, Palm Beach County officials to participate in 
uh, a visit to Austin, Texas. Uh, they had come, Austin, uh, their, their CAP Metro, uh, which is an independent transit agency that runs everything from uh, e-scooters to, um, to uh, light rail uh, and commuter rail. Uh, actually came here for a visit back in 2019, Pure Exchange. The idea was then to return the favor uh, and and actually get on site and see what's see what it's like to have a highly integrated, very diverse kind of a transportation system. Uh, so there was about 15 uh, officials who visited Austin last week, and we got that firsthand look at their uh, multimodal system, uh, their transit system. Like most of these big, bold kind of activities, shifting from the car-centric kind of behavior we all have to something where you might actually consider mass transit, as we were just talking about a moment ago, requires a lot of hard work, some successes, a lot of successes, and some failures, and learning from the failures. So we were trying to cut the corner a little bit by maybe learning from their failures as well as their successes. So we had a chance to have two full days of both on the site exposure where we rode on their electrified buses. Uh, we rode on their light rail system, uh, e-scooters, uh, bikes, uh, walked on their, on their pathways along the river, um, basically just tried to experience it. Most importantly, you know, we, you hear this conversation about mixed-use development. In fact, we have a crew standing out there waiting for one of our first <laughs> formal mixed-use development activities. And this was a chance to see that mixed-use, transit-oriented development for real, in existence, in neighborhoods, along the light rail system. Um, and to get off the light rail, to walk not even a quarter of a mile to a local choice of restaurants and, and other uh, kinds of services, um, gyms, things of that nature, right there in the neighborhood, exactly the way it was described, but it's for real. And, and so pretty cool just to experience, more importantly, to have the opportunity to say, well, yeah, but what about this? And, and we had some of those conversations. In fact, by the second day, um, the Palm Beach County group was, was introduced, uh, and, some, and the next pres presenter said, oh, so I understand you all have a lot of questions. And we did. And we had a really, really good conversation. So one of the things we brought back was you don't do anything this big without having everybody in the tent. And, and so the key is making sure that all stakeholders have a, a real, real opportunity to engage and, and to then carry it all the way through from the planning stage all the way to the actual implementation activity. And that's what they've got going right now. They've got a group called um, ATP, Austin Transit Partnership. And it's a public-private partnership that's helping with the continuation of the execution of their, of their plan. They've also got a massive comprehensive plan. So you can, you can find the bike routes, you can find the, the walking trails, you can find the, uh, the stations, you can find the TOD. You can find it all in this one, one plan. And uh, it is interesting how the recurring theme was when people ask, what's in it for me? Because the rail is not my neighborhood. Um, when you have this large plan, you can show how uh, one piece affects the other pieces and how people benefit overall. It's a big challenge. Um, Little by little, these little bites, like uh, coming down from Port St. Lucie and that type of thing, is a way for people to sample uh, what it could be like as, as we go forward. So we're very hopeful. It was, it was a good trip. It was definitely worthwhile. I think one of the most important things was um, some of the folks that were on there were, I think, some of the folks that you really need uh, to have in agreement to move anything this big forward. Uh, we had uh, the county mayor, Greg Weiss. We had a county administrator, Verdine Baker. County Assistant Administrator, Tom Bod Laren, County Engineer, David Brick, Palm Tram, Executive uh, Director, Clinton Forb, uh, the Economic Council President and CEO, Michelle Jacobs. A good group of folks uh, to be coming on board on the same page together. And, and actually, I think most walked away feeling not only informed, uh, but also kind of inspired and excited about the possibilities here. As somebody said, though, it's complicated. And somebody else said, yeah, but it's doable. So hopefully that latter part really pays off and actually becomes the case here in Palm Beach County. That completes my report. Good, good. 
I'm glad we had that. I'm glad we had that session, and the the right people were there. Um, uh, so we we've, we've got to make some big steps. We'll, I, I will be talking about this more and more as we go forward over the next several months, in terms of what um, some some of the initial major steps that need to be done um, for the, the county to really uh, seriously move move with a, with an initiatives to do these things. So thanks. That's good. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so save the date. Saturday, May 13th is our Cultural Diversity Day. Very From good. 1 to okay. 8 in Veterans Park. And the village is partnering with um, Caribbean American for Community Involvement, which we know and love as CAFSI. And there will be live music, displays, and vendors, and lots of fun. So we hope you all come out for that. And that's my report. Okay. No report, Mayor. Thank you. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Right, that completes our reports for this evening. Um, is anyone here in the audience that has a petition they'd like to present to the council? Now would be the time to do that. I don't see any petition presenters out there, so I'm going to close the floor to petitions for the evening. And now I'd like to, uh, is the portion in the meeting where we take statements from the public on items not on the uh, agenda. And we have an introduction tonight from our fire chief. I think he'd like to come up and speak with us. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member, staff. Uh, tonight I have the privilege of introducing the first petition uh, that I have been promoted to this chief for a few years. Wow, congratulations. Battalion 2 and 4. Uh, she also serves as the department's recruitment and human resources development officer. Chief Romero has most recently been working as the operations aide under the deputy chief and division chief of operations. Chief Romero serves as the subcommittee chair for the Fire Chiefs Association of Palm Beach County Safety and Health Collaborative and on the Firefighters Benevolent Fund. She has also served on the regional diversity recruitment team for the Fire Chiefs Association for five years and as a department's recruitment team chair. She has worked on the department's hurricane command team and is a certified chaplain volunteering with the department's chaplain team. Wow. She is a Florida State Certified Fire Officer 1, fire instructor, and fire inspector, and will soon have her fire service administration degree. Uh, I've known Amanda for the past 22 years as we got hired together in 2001, so it's been great to grow up in the department together, and it's a great honor to have her come in here and take this role, and I have no doubt that she will continue moving the direction that we've been going and really serving the community of rural Palm Beach. So with that, Mr. Chief Amanda Romero. Thank you. First, I'd like to say, please excuse my attire, as we may have had an incident at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm very excited to have been given the opportunity to serve your community as District 28. Um, as you probably know, there's nine stations in, um, battalion, in Battalion 2. Um, I am a 20-year resident of Wellington, and I have three kids. So along with that resume, add mommy to it. Um, <laughs> my husband is also, works, also works for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. He's a captain out in Battalion 3. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to working with each one of you and accomplishing and continuing to move forward to accomplish the goals that you've set forth and to um, work on this, this relationship with the community and how we can get together and, and best serve the community we serve. So thank you very much. It's nice to meet you all. Congratulations. Thank you. We, thank you. We thank you. We'd like to welcome you aboard. And um, we think that uh, you, the fire department servicing Royal Palm Beach has done a tremendous job. And I'm sure you, you're going to continue to excel in that regard. What we'd like to do now is have a little photo op. Is that okay, Council? Can I, can I hide behind somebody? <laughs> this is the garlic
Okay. Diane, do we have any advanced comments from the public on non-agenda items or no, items on the consent agenda? No? Ray, we have anyone with their hands raised out there? Okay. And I see nobody with their hands raised here. So at this time, I'm going to close the floor to uh, non-agenda item comments or comments on the consent agenda. And so with that, Diane, give us the consent agenda. Yes, please. Mayor, thank you. Number one, approval of the minutes for the council organization meeting and council regular meeting of March 16, 2023. Two, approval and authorization in accordance with established policy to make a budget amendment for Fund 303 in the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Said amendment to transfer a total of $25,000 from Project PW 2004 Civic Center Way Monument to Project PW 2105 Street Light Replacement La Mancha. Three, approval of a special event permit for Yemen Abdelnabi to hold a skate contest at Royal at the Royal Palm Beach Skate Arena on Saturday, May 13, 2023, during the hours the park is open. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments on member of council or anything on the consent agenda? If not, I'll look for a motion. Motion approved. Consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the record show that consent agenda was approved 5 0. And with that, we'll go to our regular agenda. We have a lot of items on the regular agenda tonight. So, uh, R1, agenda, regular agenda item R1, is a public hearing and approval of resolution uh, number 23 05, a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, authorizing the mayor to execute an interlocal agreement with Palm Beach County pursuant to sections 163 01. No. 136.01 and 171.046 Florida statutes for the annexation of an enclave consisting of 232 parcels totaling less than 110 acres. 110 acres. Okay, so with that, introduce yourself, sir. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, for the record, my name is Josu Ledger, Senior Planner with the um, Planning and Zoning Department. Okay. The item before you is a request for approval of resolution number 23-05, authorizing the mayor to execute an end local agreement with Palm Beach County pursuant to sections of 163.01 and 171.046 Florida statutes for the annexation of one enclave consisting of 232 parcels totaling less than 110 acres. The subject property known as the Sunset Isle Condominium is located off of Park Trail Road North, south of Okeechobee Boulevard, and consists of approximately 18.4 acres in land area. Um, the Sunset Isle Enclave is an existing development consisting of um, 232 parcels. Pursuant to section 171.031.13, Florida statutes defines an enclave as any unincorporated, improved, or developed area that is enclosed within and bounded on all four sides by a single municipality. Pursuant to Florida statutes, section 171.046.2a, the Sunset Isle Enclave qualifies to be annexed by an local agreement. Therefore, the agreement to annex um, the um, said enclave is consistent with state statutes. Um, this slide illustrates a visual of the Sunset Isle Enclave bounded on all four sides by the village municipal boundaries. Subsequently, once this process is completed, staff will take the following actions. Um, we'll conduct a village-initiated future land use map amendment, also considered as FLUM, to ensure consistency with the comprehensive plan, a zoning map amendment, rezoning, 
last but not least, adopt uh, by reference the existing site plan of record for the development. To date, staff received about five inquiries, four emails, and one phone call regarding the annexation. And mostly there were general questions asking what's an annexation. And one of them was a request for staff to provide the documentations and report um, that you guys have before you. And we've provided that information. Um, none of these inquiries express any um, opposition to the annexation. Staff send out mailed notices to every impacted property owners as part of the requirements for the adoption of um, the um, interlocal agreement. Once again, the agreement is consistent with um, state statutes. Upon council review, staff recommends a motion to approve resolution number 23-05, authorizing the mayor to execute the interlocal agreement with Palm Beach County. This concludes my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Before we take uh, questions from, from council, uh, Diane, did we have any advanced no, comments from the public on this agenda item? No. no. Ray, do we have any uh, hands raised? All right, I have not received any comment cards on this agenda item, but is there anyone here who would like to comment on it? I'll give you that opportunity. Everybody saying no? <laughs> All right, so we're going to close public comment into agenda item on one and take comments and questions from council. Go ahead, Selena. And real quick, is there anybody here that lives in Sunny Isles? Okay. And then do we know how many, I know we mailed up the letters to the homeowner, but do we know how many of them are renters currently occupying the unit versus? No. Cause, okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, may I ask the, the, the general basis of the questions that were inquired? So um, the most common one for the four emails that we got was, what's an annexation? Um, most of these owners never heard of what's an annexation, so we ended up um, drafting a an, an, uh, standard email, sent it out to them, and the phone call we had, we explained it, and they, had, they, they, just, they were glad to know what it is. So. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? I, I just like, you had a slide before that, you, you took down and talked about some of the rationale behind why this makes sense. That one, yeah. Um, it, 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 this slide it talks a little bit about why the legislature put this, this, this law on the books to begin with, uh, because there were enclave situations happening across the state, and it creates a, a planning and support problem for the city that that enclave is in, because uh, we still have to provide a continuity of service to all the quote unquote uh, inhabitants or citizens uh, within our jurisdiction, within our, our, uh, our city. Um, and the other uh, thing I wanted to note is that uh, this will extend completely the uh, District 9 PBSO uh, coverage and support uh, for this, this area now that we're going to stop calling it an enclave because it's going to hopefully be part, it'll be part of the village, it'll be part of Royal Palm Beach like everything else is part of Royal Palm Beach. So. Um, if there are no other questions and comments from members on council, I'll look for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve regular agenda item number one. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane Lane, please let the record show that uh, agenda item all one was approved five zero. Is there an action or something we have to take, Ray or Keith? Uh, do we have to send something out now at this point, or what's the next step? Yes. So they have to do a thing too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we anticipate any, any problems with that? No? Okay. And Mr. Mayor, just so you know, it's set for the June 13th BOCC meeting with the county. Is, okay. Is it, is it necessary for us to have representation to be available for questions at that meeting? I think Josu and I were both planning to be in attendance. You, you will be there? So Josu and I will be there. So yeah. you'll be able to address any questions that may right. have. Right? Okay, good. All right. With that done, We'll move on to agenda item R2. Agenda item R2 is a public hearing to consider application number 23-024, an application for J.P. Morton Planning and, La and Landscape Architecture 
on behalf of Boulevard Shops, LLC. The applicant is seeking an architectural and artistic approval for the installation of a powder-coated aluminum sculpture to fulfill the art and public places requirement for a property located at 11925 and 11931 on Southern Boulevard. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, so we'll have to have folks sworn in. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is the applicant here? Did they? I believe they were supposed to be here, but I haven't seen them. Okay, if they appear, they were here for planning and zoning on Monday. They were here. They sent, uh, they didn't do a presentation, so they sort of sent one of their people. All right, so know. in their absence, what I'll do is just ask for ex parte disclosures from the council on this item. None. No. Okay, thank you. And I guess Mario, we'll see if they appear. Yeah. So good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I have a short presentation for you, and we'll be continuing sort of the inclusion of public art in the community. Um, and this application before you is number 23-024. Actually, let me not open it up here. So the application before you is 23-024 AAR. The applicant, J. Morton Planning and Landscape Architecture, on behalf of Boulevard Shops LLC, is requesting architectural approval for the installation of a public art sculpture to meet their art and public places requirement according to section 26-75.5 of the Village Code. This first slide here illustrates uh, 11931 Southern Boulevard. This next slide illustrates 11925 Southern Boulevard. This one here illustrates the entire property. So that's what, uh, the Cypress Key Town Center. This slide here illustrates uh, the location of the public artwork on the site plan. And a little background information on the artist. Her name is Lucy Keshavars. Uh, she's a professional artist and currently acts as a consultant in community engagement, public, and ecological art. Keshavar's artistic journey began working with performing arts organizations and directing the Gardens Art Program in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Her journey continued by opening Art and Culture Group, Inc., which aims to create connections between communities and the arts, and by that, creating public art projects. Um, the artist has completed several public art projects in various locations in Palm Beach County and Martin County. Her work engages the ideas of integrated public art and eco-art, highlighting the importance of integrating nature and public art. Over the past decade, uh, Kesha Vars has created a lasting legacy in South Florida in the arena of public art. Here is a digital rendering of the public artwork that they are applying uh, mm -hmm. for to be on site. The artwork is entitled Ring Canopy. Uh, it's created by the artist uh, and the sculpture measures 13 foot by 6 inches high, 6 foot wide, and 6 foot deep. It is a bright white gloss powder coated aluminum sculpture, and it's located um, at the place where I showed in the previous slides. This slide illustrates several pictures of a standalone sculpture, um, and they demonstrate the intricate and elegant arrangement of rings and beams of the sculpture that act as an abstract rendition of the natural environment. Is this already built or they have to build it there? This is a, this is a built piece. So they're just installing This exists, it. yes. You'll, okay. you'll see in the following slide, I believe. Okay. Um, and the rings of the sculpture resemble the complex play of light and shapes observable in the canopy of trees. So hmm. the sculpture really is sort of an abstraction of a tree, you know, creating sort of an abstract rendition of our environment. This slide illustrates the existing public art, artwork currently in a temporary exhibit in Clearwater, Florida. So this is a temporary exhibit, and this is currently where it is. You can, I'd like to add this slide. You can see sort of the dimensions. It's a quite large piece, which is, I think, a, a good thing. Um, and meeting all requirements, staff is recommending approval of application number 23-024 as submitted. That concludes my application, and if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, was there an anticipation that the applicant would be here, or did we know that they were? They were here for planning and zoning. Uh, I believe they did. What happened to planning and zoning? Everything was okay. They, they didn't present, so 
Okay. All right. That's... They had a presentation, and then when I showed them my presentation, the okay. they sort of said, okay. no, no additional information. So. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's, I think it's attractive. What do I know about it all? I don't know. Huh? Is that abstract? <laughs> it's true. Part of your journey. Is that what it is? Okay. Diane, do we have any early uh, advance comments from the public on this item? No? Item R2? Uh, Ray, anyone have their hand raised? Why? I have, <laughs> I have not received any comment cards on agenda item R2, but if anyone here would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing okay, uh, public comments on agenda item R2. And if there are questions and comments from the council, if none, I'll look for a motion. I just have two quick questions, and you can answer both of them. Sure. So, um, number one, because of the powder, even though it's aluminum, because of the powder coating, we don't have to worry about reflection because that is facing east. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think, okay. I, I think it's gloss, but sort of a material kind of maybe similar to a car where it doesn't sort of shine it's not, back exactly. at you. Exactly. You're not yeah. going to get the reflection come back. Okay. And then my other question is, is the is the actual piece that they're going to install in clear water and they're moving it here? Or is yeah. It, okay. So the actual piece, it's currently... That, so this last yep. slide here, that's where it lives currently, so it's yep. a temporary installation, and the idea is to move it to this location here on the digital rendering. Is this going to be a permanent location? That's the permanent. So it's not going to move right, six it won't. It, okay. Right, it won't. Gotcha. Basically, that's a permanent living Thanks. spot. Okay. Just a quick question about the lights. Once we purchase this, the maintenance of the lights is our... No, it's not our... It's the... the, the it's the, the, the who bought it, but basically the developer, the developer. it's their responsibility. Yeah, it's that under okay. village code, yeah. maintenance is required. Okay. Comes out that, that 1% uh, allocation? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just, just clarify. Any other questions? If not, I'll look for a motion if there's no further questions or comments. Since they're bringing art to my neck of the woods, I'll say uh, make okay. a motion to approve uh, regular agenda item R2. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that we have more art coming in for the public. Uh, agenda item R2 was approved 5-0. Woohoo. Okay. Agenda item, thank you so much. Okay. We're, see, we're moving slowly, but we, it's coming, right? Okay. So far, though, all of the things that we've been looking at have really been nice. Good stuff. I mean, so, okay. Okay, agenda item R3 is a public hearing to consider application number 23-016 and approval of resolution number 23-13 confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking an easement uh, abandonment for property located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately 2.27 uh, miles west of State Road 7. Uh, this is, it's not quite the issue. So, so you are going to work tonight, okay. Who, <laughs> 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 me? <laughs> no. Good. Come down to your sugar high. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. right, right. You're on, on Bradford. Good. Right. I think they're going to go out and party after this. Yeah. Good evening. Um, the applicant is requesting Village Council to abandon an access easement um, recorded at the, uh, book 1024, page 23, for a property located on the south side of Southern Boulevard. Um, this is a, the site shows the location and the site. This access easement for a roadway purposes was granted over a 30 foot wide strip of land known as Acme Road. Um, staff is recommending approval of this application and this abandonment. With that being said, Mayor, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Okay. The applicant like to make comments. So you're satisfied with the presentation provided by staff? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just want to get that on the record. <laughs> All right. Before we take comments from council, uh, Diane, do we have any advanced comments on this no. young item? Any hands raised? No hands raised? I've received no comment cards on this agenda item R3, but if anyone would like to comment, I'll give them that option now. And if not, closing the floor to public comment on agenda item R3. Open for comments from members on council. Questions? Yeah. 
just wanted to clarify with Bradford, the reason for banning this easement is because it's no longer going to be necessary and there's other things that are going to accommodate or take the place of this, correct? Of, yes, sir, yes, okay. correct. That's it. Thanks, Bradford. No further comments or questions? We'll look for a motion. Make a motion to approve um, regular agenda item number three. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show agenda item R3 was approved 5-0. Moving forward <laughs> to agenda item R4 is also a public hearing to consider application number 23-17. An approval of resolution number 23-14 confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking an easement abandonment for property located on the south side of, of Southern Boulevard, 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. And we just said the same thing again, but okay. Right. <laughs> yes. The, the, the last one was an access easement. This one is a utility easement. Okay. Um, so there's, we're we, recommending We probably could have thrown that in there, but that's okay. We're good. <laughs> that's all I have. That's it? <laughs> Applicant accepts the presentation as made. Okay. Diane, any advanced comments? No comments, item all four? Right, no hands, right? Boy, that's isn't that boring for you? No hands for you. <laughs> I have not received comment cards on the agenda item, but if anyone would like to comment, I'll give them that option to do now. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R4. Open up for comments and questions from members on council. If there are none, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve uh, regular agenda item number four. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show agenda item R4 was approved 5-0. Moving right along, agenda item R5 is also a public hearing to consider application number 22-1105. An application by Urban Design Studio in adoption of resolution number 23-11 confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking preliminary plat approval for replat the previously Oh, to replat the previously approved master plat for Tuttle Royal <laughs> to add nine point approximately nine point two eight nine acres for a total of replatted area of one of approximately one six point three five acres for a property located on the south side of, of Southern Boulevard, approximately point two nine two seven miles west of State Road seven. And this too is not quasi judicial. So Great. Thank you again, Mayor. Um, this plat conforms to the platting requirements of Village Code, more specifically the Section 22.2 preliminary plat and 2686 parens 4. Um, the preliminary plat is consistent with the currently approved site plans for Pod 2, Pod 3, Pod 4, Pod 7, and the site plan for Erica Boulevard. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission approved this application on April 17th, um, and staff is recommending approval. And I'll turn the floor back over to you. Okay. How's the applicant feel about that? Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Diane, any advanced comments, public no, comments? Mayor. No agenda item R5. <clears throat> no hands raised on agenda item R5? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, who knows? I have not received any comment cards on agenda item R5, but I will accept comments if anyone wants to make one. Seeing none. I'm closing public comment on agenda item R5. Open up for questions and comments from members on council. If there are none, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item R5. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> we have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show agenda item R5 was approved 5-0. Agenda item R6. Is a public hearing to consider application number 23-010, an application by Urban Design Studios, an adoption of resolution number 23-06, confirming the council's action. Applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for retail sales, MXS, in order to permit a grocery store that exceeds 20,000 square feet within Main Street of Tuttle Royale and located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. This is a quasi-judicial item, and individuals will have to be sworn in. Now, let me ask this question. 
this is a quasi-judicial, and the next item is quasi-judicial. Many, many more. That. I only have to swear them in once. So you could do it for all? Okay. Yep. Yep. No, you said you could or you can? You I could. Can. Okay, yes. good. All right. So anybody from the applicant's team who is going to speak, if you could raise your right hands, Bradford, I'll swear you in at this time, too. Do you all swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, and I'll turn back to council. You got more. That's good. They, they, they came in late, but they're good. You're good Any okay. ex parte disclosures from council on this one? I've had discussions yeah. with uh, the applicant as well as mayor, uh, the uh, manager. Village manager. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Great. Thank you. So um, the way that I want to uh, go through the next five items. So the first one, these are all special exceptions, and so I'll touch upon the um, re review and approval criteria over the, just the, the neck, this, this item, and then for the other ones, I'll just cut right straight right, to so the meat and potatoes. You're going to cover all five now, but we will have to no, vote no, on them indi individually. Right here. So no, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is to, my, my, my first presentation on the first special exception, I'll go through my okay. entire presentation. But I won't go through the review criteria and approval criteria okay. for the subsequent four. Okay. And no just, for, okay. just a clarification real quick. And going through these is because of the special exception. It's for MXSs only, correct? Right. So for people watching at home, it's not like somebody, publics can come back in and say, yes, now I want right. to. Okay. So, so within the MXS, whenever you have bays that are larger than, or uses that are um, occupying a bay larger than 20,000 square feet, um, certain uses require a special exception for them. Okay. Good. Great. So the applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for a retail sales MXS in order to permit a grocery store that exceeds 20,000 square feet within pod six of Main Street Total Royale. The proposed grocery store will total 26,000 square feet and will be located in the first level of building nine of pod six. Um, in reviewing the proposed special exception, village staff considered compatibility with adjacent land uses, consistency with the village's comprehensive plan, and conformance with the village's development standards for the mixed use social center, and specifically whether the proposed special exception is consistent with the standards of the village comprehensive plan, complies with development regulations of village code, does not have adverse environmental impacts, does not have adverse vehicle or pedestrian traffic impacts, does not have an adverse impact upon public facilities, does not have an adverse impact on adjacent properties, compatible with the character and living conditions of the existing neighborhood. <clears throat> and the proposed special exception did not seriously reduce air quality or quantity of light and air available to adjacent properties. Um, staff has determined that the proposed special exception conforms to the village's standards and therefore is recommending approval of application. Um, the Planning Zoning Commission considered this application on April 17th, 2023, and recommended approval. And with that being said, Mayor, I'll turn the floor back over. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Patrick. The applicant like to make comments. Brian Tuttle and the applicant will please with the Planning Department's presentation. This was uh, originally going to be a fresh market, which is the fresh market located in Wellington on Forest Hill Boulevard. Publix uh, decided that they liked that piece of property, so they bought it. And this is going to be Publix? No, Publix is evicting the Fresh Market on oh, Forest Oh, the Hill other Boulevard. place. Oh, okay. So Fresh Market wants to stay in the market, so they so came they're going to come here? And yesterday we were contacted by um, Sprouts, who said they're not giving up the territory, and so they're going to come in and make a bid to come put a Sprouts there. So it's, it's going to be very good. We're either going to have a Sprouts that's, or a That's a interesting, because I, I think... Aren't they closing? <laughs> well, no, aren't they closing a store that they have over? Yeah, yeah. Seven? yeah, they're closing it down at the end of the month. Obviously, they there's That's more to that story than we know, too. They just want to be where Total Royal is. There you go. We'll go with that. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's for it's okay. for a grade A best in class yeah. grocery store. Okay. Good. Um before we take comments from council, Diane, any Advanced comments from the public? No comments. Mayor. Okay. Any hands raised, Greg, on agenda item R6? No. I have no public comment card submitted to me on agenda item R6. Anyone here would like to speak, you're welcome. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R6. Comments from members on council? Questions? If there are none, I look for a motion. Motion what? to approve regular agenda R6. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R6 was approved 5-0. Uh, agenda item R7 is a public hearing to consider application number 23-011, an applicant by Urban Design Studios, an adoption of resolution number 23-07, confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking special exception use approval to allow for retail sales MXS in order to permit a movie theater indoor use that use that exceeds 20,000 square feet within Main Street at Tuttleworth and located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. And everyone has been sworn in already, so traffic. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, as stated, the applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for a uh, movie theater indoor. The proposed movie theater will total 25,389 square feet and will be located on the second level of Building 3 of Pod 6. The Plan and Zoning Commission considered this application at their April 17th meeting and recommended approval. Staff is recommending approval, and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. The applicant is pleased with the presentation, and this will either be a IPIC movie theater or a Apple Cinema movie theater or a Landmark movie. Yeah, what's cinemas. the difference? Are there any differences? Um, they're all higher-end, best-in-class recliner type. Um, it's just which one we can uh, get to lease and get to the proper credit for the banks. Okay. But, um, you know, my first choice is IPIC because, of the, you know, they're, they're, they're yeah. just great. Uh, Apple Cinemas is more of a New York, New Jersey. Um, yeah. Have you heard of them? Yes. Yeah. So I had never heard of them before. And then landmark theaters, but again, it'll be a best in class theater. Okay. Diane, any comments? No, Mayor. Ava no advanced comments. Wow. Ray, any hands raised? Agenda item R7. I have not received any comment cards on agenda item R7. Does anyone here would like to comment? Now would be the time. Seeing none. Um, closing public comment on agenda item R7. Look for comments and questions from members on council. Just real quick to make Mr. Tuttle get back up again. <laughs> <laughs> These theaters, just to clarify, are they the ones that serve food and alcohol in them in your seats? Is it not a full restaurant, but that they do have those, or they're just the standard? We're negotiating. They'll all serve food. Um, I pick would serve a higher level food. Um, the other ones would serve food. They all serve alcohol. Yes, food and alcohol with recliners. Okay. None will have a restaurant in them. Okay. So it is still the movie theater experience, but it's not the bar, like how they had at City Place where you could go right. into the bar seven. Right. Okay. Right. We have such great restaurants, they can't compete with them, so gotcha. they don't want to try. Do you have any idea how many viewing areas they'll have? There, I think it's six or eight theaters and how many seats? Anywhere from 400 okay. to 607 to 8. Some will be like 50, you know, 50s, and then some will be 100. It'll be, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's the new style. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, this is going to be on the second level. Yes. What's going to be beneath? He's getting there. Aha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I guess I didn't pay close enough attention when I was looking at this. I probably could have figured that out myself. I believe right? the improv is under them, correct? If you read in today's newspaper, uh -huh. there was an article about a related closing the movie theater at City Place. Yes, I saw that. Uh, they also closed the improv. So they actually moved forward with that, huh? They were yeah. thinking about it. It's interesting. Well, uh, interesting. come to uh, Royal Palm Beach, and we've got, you know. Now we don't have to drive downtown. We're going to take trips well, off that's, the road. That's part of the object of the exercise. <laughs> right. cool. But let's not talk about traffic, though, okay? <laughs> Any other comments, questions, or members, council? If not, I'll look for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve regular agenda item number seven. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? If no opposed, Diane, please let the record show agenda item R7 was approved 5 0. Agenda item R8 is a public hearing to consider application number 23 12. An application by Urban Design Studios, an adoption of resolution number 23-08, confirming council's action. The applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for retail sales, MXS, 
in order to permit a fitness center use that use that exceeds 20,000 square feet within the main street at Tuttle Royale located on the south side of Southern Boulevard approximately 0.27 <coughs> miles west of State Road 7 everyone's been sworn in already this is quasi judicial graphic you are great thank you again there um, the proposed fitness center will be located on the first and second level of building nine within pod six The proposed fitness center use will total 50,000 square feet with 12,000 square feet located on the first floor and 38,000 square feet located on the second floor. The Planning and Zoning Commission um, approved this application, and the village staff is recommending approval. And I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this will either be an LA Fitness new, they only have one in America. It's in Los Angeles. It's called the LA Fitness Signature Club, Club Studio. There's only one in America? Say it again. It's called. Yes, yeah, it's it's LA Fitness's new club studio. They're trying to compete with, um, no. No, this is the opposite. Lifetime. If you've ever heard of Lifetime oh. Fitness, they're I've trying lifetime, to yeah. make a step towards that. These memberships will be, you know, $99 versus $29. But they have a lot more stuff. They have a um, bike rooms and yoga and infrared and cold plunges and hot tubs and Hot tubs, huh? Okay. Best in class. Okay. Sounds so there's good. there's only one open and so we'd be the East Coast Irvine. venue for I think they're doing one in Miami East somewhere. Irvine. But we don't we don't call <laughs> call that a, you know, that's Miami. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Interesting. Thank you. Diane, any advance no, public comments on this item? Agenda item um Eight, yeah, yeah. R eight. <laughs> Ray, any hands raised? <laughs> okay. I have no comment cards on this agenda item, but if anyone would like to comment, I'll give you that opportunity. If not, <clears throat> I'm going to close public comments to agenda item R eight. Look for comments and questions from council. If there are none, I'll look for a motion. <laughs> you really think so, huh? Well, we'll see what the future holds. I don't know. I think I think they can. <laughs> but the thing, if they show up, that will attract more people. So, if there are no questions or uh, comments, I look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item R eight. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show agenda item R eight was approved five zero. Agenda item R9 is a public hearing to consider application number 23-013, an application by Urban Design Studios in adoption with resolution number 23-09, confirming council's action. The applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for retail sales, MXS, in order to permit a bowling alley use that, use that exceeds 20,000 square feet within Main Street on Tuttle Royale and located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. This is a uh, quasi-judicial process. Have you sworn in already? Bradford, tell us about this. Great, thank you. Um, the proposed bowling alley use will total 31,398 square feet and will be located on the second level of Building 3. The proposed bowling alley use will consist of 25,898 um, dedicated to the bowling alley lanes, 5,500 square feet will be will consist of food, beverage, and arcade space. The Planning and Zoning Commission approved this application April 17th, and staff is recommending approval of this application. I'll turn the floor back over to you. How many lanes? 20, 29 lanes. 30 lanes. 30 30 lanes. 30. <laughs> Big enough to have a league, but small enough to be... The new style, it'll have a restaurant, a bar up front, and an arcade. It'll have a regular, regular full bar? Yeah. Yep. And then the, the lanes all have those new automatic scores and all that stuff. You yeah. Just, well, you no, gotta, math no math involved. <laughs> so it scores itself. <laughs> that, okay. Uh, long They're long actually run by AI, and they tell you where you're... Right. Yeah. You can see the marks where you're doing Exactly. It. But if there's a bowling alley, there will be leaks. Yes. So... Yes, yeah. again, for the community to come and hang out. Yeah, no, that sounds sounds great. Um, Diane, my same question. Any comments, public no comments, advanced right? comments? No, okay. 
Ray, my same question. Any hands raised on agenda item R9? No? I still haven't received any comment cards tonight on agenda item R9 or any other item yet. Uh, but if anyone would like to comment, I'd love to hear your comments. Seeing none, I'm closing the public uh, the, uh, agenda item R9 and public comment. Open for questions and comments from council. If there are no questions or comments, go ahead. Who is well, Go ahead. Well, my, <coughs> my question was, I know I've heard the mayor talk about this over the years. Uh, would you know how, I mean, it, it's kind of like a desert out here. Is it, where is the closest bowling alley to this location? Because the only one I know, and um, my experience is, my kids, when they're going to summer camp, they would always go to a trip to a bowling alley, but it was always what? South and way east on Lake Worth Road, right? Green Acres. In Green Acres. It's Green Acres. Um, okay, so it's 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 a good Tropicana. it's that a good amount closed. east. This is going to be such a good. It's and there's nothing out west no, either, there's correct? There's nothing from the Turnpike west and all of Palm Beach County. We don't know about. It. Okay, so that was my question. So I thought that Delray Marketplace had a bowl. Delray Market. Delray Marketplace does have a bowl. Is, yes. is that this time? Is that, so if I wanted to go see what it's going to Yes, like, it's, it's similar, but a different, different, but very, very similar. Okay. And um, you're right, that, that is one. And it, it's actually doing okay there. I mean, it's everywhere been there a while, also. so I, I assume that it has been. Yeah, I mean, that's it's one of the pushbacks that I've heard about the idea of putting oh, bowling alley. Kind of like, what? At, no, I'm talking about the one she's on yeah. Green Acres. Yeah. Always keep this in context. They built that center where the traffic counts were like 182 trips. <laughs> I mean, it's surrounded by farmland. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not even go there. Okay. okay. <laughs> and it still survives. And and the bowling does well. Well, do you? Okay. I think I my experience has been, but when it comes to bowling alleys, if you build them, they will come. So, can I tell you? Other questions? Oh, well, baseball too, but. <laughs> no, no, no. Any, any other questions or comments for uh, Mr. Tuttle? No? Are there no more questions or comments for members of the council? I'll look for a motion. I'll do this one. I make a motion to approve regular agenda item number nine because it's the bowling alley. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that. Percentage uh, regular agenda item number nine was approved five zero. Wow. Regular agenda item number ten. We're out of we're in double digits now here. Okay. Public here is a public hearing to consider an application number twenty three dash zero one four, an application by Urban Design Studios, an adoption of resolution number twenty three dash one zero, confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking a special exception use approval to allow for a restaurant with bar or lounge with live entertainment to be part of a comedy club use within Main Street at Total Royal, located on the south side of Southern Boulevard, approximately 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. Quasi-judicial item that was already, everyone sworn in already. Practice. Great, thank you. Um, the comic, comedy club will total 19,919 square feet and will be located on the first level of Building 3. The applicant is proposing 13,919 square feet dedicated to the comic club lounge and live entertainment area, and 6,000 square feet will consist of restaurant bar space. The Planning and Zoning Commission approved this application on April 17th, and village staff is recommending approval, and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. The applicant is satisfied with the presentation. As previously stated, it's the Improv Comedy Club and Copper Blue. So I just got to question, how does this work? Where, the, the, where, does the, where does the talent come from? Is this something the club people, they create that and control that or manage that? Well, the, from, from what I understand, the guys who started it were ex-comics. -com so they knew everyone in the industry. So they started the first one. I think they have how many, Ryan? Six, seven? And so once you get to know the comics, you get them in your schedule, and they start coming like, uh, Hart still comes here because he started originally in one of these things. So it's like a circuit, and this they get this becomes part of the circuit. Yes. Do they give the regular people, you know, do they have like amateur night or something like that? Where oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They do all that. They're yeah, they're very excited about that. That should be interesting. So it's <laughs> I go. 
too big minimum? <laughs> have you ever? I love going. I go about once a month at least. So, okay. and what they do is when they don't have a name brand, normally it's twenty nine dollars to get in, mm. and have a two drink minimum. But you know they don't always have the best talent. So once you go and fill out the card, yeah, they send you free tickets. Yeah. So you know you just have the two drink minimum. So you know we go a lot for that. They're not always the best, but the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Go, don't go anywhere. Go. Hold on, we got questions. No, no. I'll do it now. That's. Oh, you want to? You awake? Comment. Okay. <laughs> Any advance comment? Public comments coming? No. No hands raised. Okay. This is agenda item number R10. We're talking about. I have received no comment cards, but if anyone would like to comment. See none. I'm closing public comment agenda item R10. Now we're open for comments and questions. So, um, because if I'm correct, midnight they close. We close the area then uh, Monday through or Sunday through Thursday. Friday, Saturday open till one. I want to make sure that when because usually with the improv they do two shows a night. So how does this? Uh, reflect that if the bar is going to stay open for when people come out of the second show, just kind of. No, no, no. They have to adjust their schedule. They okay. know to meet the village's criteria. Okay. So they may move one down, but they everybody understands that by midnight everything closes. Bars close. Everything's closed. Okay. And, and then I'm on Friday and Saturday. The weekends. And then the um, I believe with the restaurant area, do, is there outdoor seating? Oh, every we, restaurant okay. requires almost a third of their seating to be outside. outside. It's all about big okay. patios. Here. Right. Oh, very nice. It's beautiful. Yeah. I just want to then, if they allow entertainment in the restaurant, is that because that is all in that confined area, and then there's the residents that are up above, starting on the third floor. So I just want to make sure that I understand how. Well, a as it stands today, we're not putting any live entertainment in buildings that have residential units above it. Gotcha. Thank as you. of today. And that is the plan moving okay. forward, not as, have, as of today. We'll I've heard it say yeah. twice. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> I didn't have the alcohol yet at the improv, so I heard it twice. <laughs> let me let me uh, talk to you about two types of entertainment. Okay. Copper blues, five man band, you know, uh, we're talking to the Tequila Cowboy guys. That was started by Dirk Bentley and them, and they're looking at doing a 10,000-square-foot restaurant. Those are bands. No bands will be under residential. Plus, if we have noise issues, they're all made to have glass doors to close. Now, what we are doing is we're requiring all the smaller restaurants to have entertainment, like a guy on a piano or a, uh, you know, like there's a Rigna, uh, Irish pub where they get a three-man Irish thing that sits in the back and sings that's gonna be so cool but yeah. but those will have music those are under some residential units but they're not bands they're just you know what I call dinner music I love the outdoor concept I love the, the third of the seating outside I love the bands inside I love all of that but I'm not living above it so that's why I just wanted to make sure <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Any other questions, members of the council? There are none. I'll look for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve regular agenda item number 10. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? If no opposed, Diane, please let the record show that regular agenda item number 10 was approved 5 0. Regular agenda item 11, or 11. Is a public hearing to consider application number 23-019, an application by Urban Design Studios for consideration of seven landscape waivers for pod six within Main Street of Tuttlewile, including waivers to allow buffer encroachment, off-center tree spacing and buffers, increased tree spacing and divider strips, shorter terminal island lengths, Elimination of trees within certain terminal and double terminal islands as set forth more specifically below for a property located south of Southern Boulevard, approximately 0.27 miles west of State Road 7. Um, when, you, when it referred to below, what are we talking about? I'm, I'm sorry, I was in the 
I was, I was distracted. That shouldn't be there, Mr. Mayor. That's a that's an error. Sorry about that. It shouldn't say that. No, it's it was just copied over from the um, agenda item summary. Okay. So, so just strike that, but it, it's it doesn't impact the, the title. Okay. You're fine. All right. So I, I don't think there's any waiver that was left out here, right? We got them all in. We're no, miss, we're and, miss any now. And okay. For brevity, I shortened the title, which is why the error is there. It was okay. it was a whole page before. Okay. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Graphic noise. Great. Thank you again. Um, the applicant is requesting seven landscape waivers for pod six. You all know the location of the site. Uh, the first waiver is to allow a 12.7 and a 12.8 foot drive aisle encroachment into the western 25 foot landscape buffers. The purpose of waiver one is to allow a drive aisle encroachment into the 25 foot perimeter landscape buffer south of building eight and a drive aisle encroachment into the 25 foot perimeter landscape buffer, buffer west of building three. And you can see here um, those areas. Um, staff believes that this is the minimum wa waiver necessary to allow reasonable use of the property. Okay. The second waiver is to allow an encroachment of building three. These are the five locations of that building encroachment into the buffer. Um, the building, the, the applicant states that the building envelope and sizes are necessary to allow the design of the code compliant parking dimensions and drive aisle uh, dimensions. Staff is recommending approval of this waiver request and concurs with the applicant's assessment. The third waiver is to allow for the required canopy trees to place not on center within the north perimeter landscape buffer along Southern Boulevard. The applicant contends that canopy trees at varying heights and species are provided to complement the royal palms along the northern perimeter buffer in pockets of landscape area south of the 10-foot underlaying share use path. Um, staff is recommending approval of this landscape waiver number three and gener generally concurs with the applicant's assessment. And you can see uh, the undulation of the 10-foot path mm -hmm. within the buffer. The fourth waiver is to allow an increase of the canopy tree spaces within perpendicular dividing strips up to 61 feet north of building 9, up to 59 feet north of building 10, and up to 65 feet north of building 12, where canopy trees are required to be spaced every 15 feet. The applicant states that the intent to use oaks within these divider meetings in order to provide a richer, denser canopy throughout the parking areas and increase shape throughout. Um, the code minimum 15 spacing restricts the ability to plant oaks in these areas. Um, with these, these areas will be supplemented with sable palms within these gaps. <coughs> Staff is recommending approval of this landscape waiver request. And this is just one of three locations. <coughs> the fifth waiver request is to allow terminal landscape islands ranging from 12.2 feet to 17.1 feet in length where village code requires terminal islands to be a minimum of 20 feet in length. Mm. Um, the terminal islands, the applicant contends that they located at the ends of each parking row will be large enough to allow the planting of trees despite substandard sizing. Um, the cutout and the required size of the island is also due to the required space needed for cars in the parallel spaces properly pull out of the space. Staff is recommending an approval of this landscape waiver request and here are some typical locations and configurations of those landscape islands. The six is to allow the elimination of the required tree within terminal islands at various locations. These locations have utilities located within these islands and the placing of a tree on top of those um, utilities complex just doesn't work. Um, and staff is recommending approval of this application, this waiver request. And again, um, in this double terminal island, um, the tree roots, there is um, utilities within this island tree roots on top of those utilities, um, they, they would just conflict. So that you see shrubs that are located there, which um, their roots do not infiltrate into those utilities like a tree root would. Staff is recommending approval of these landscape waivers. Planning Zoning Commission approved these landscape waiver requests at their April 17th meeting. And again, staff is recommending approval. And I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. You're on, sir. Great, thank you. Um, let me just see. <clears throat> yep. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Lindsay Jean Louis with Urban Design Studio. And um, Bradford did a great job and covered most of our main points. And I just wanted to express that this process has been very collaborative with staff and with the um, outside consultants. In fact, in this process, some of these waivers were suggested uh, to us by the outside consultant to make a stronger landscape product as far as the quality of trees that we could provide. Um, for example, in waiver three, in regards to the northern perimeter landscape buffer, we are providing a procession of royal palms, evenly spaced roughly 50 feet apart, that are going to provide a great entry feature and sort of a arrival or a destination as you approach Tuttle Royale when you're um, traveling on Southern Boulevard. And we are still providing the code required quantity of trees. It's just that they're not on center in regards to the undulating path. But Part of these waiver requests, such as the spacing of the trees in the divider strips, is so we could provide a live oak, a tree that provides more shade and is um, just better aesthetically with uh, proper spacing to let the roots grow and to let the tree be healthy, while still providing sable palms and trees in between as we can. So again, with this process with staff and with the landscape consultant, We've worked on lining up building architecture with the location of palms and trees that front it. So again, just want to reiterate that we have work, been working um, well together with staff, and we believe that the landscaping on Tuttle Royale will be a fantastic product. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take comments from council members, Diane, any advance hands on no, no requests? No, uh, agenda item R11, Ray? Get R11, any hands? Okay, I still haven't gotten any comment cards. <laughs> no, not on this one, okay. <laughs> I haven't received no comment cards this evening, but anyone would like to comment, I'd like to give you that opportunity now. Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R11. Look for comments or questions from members on council. I do. Um, Bradford, do you mind going back to your presentation real quick? Yours was wonderful. Just simplification is what I was looking for. If you go, okay, this is waiver number one, or whichever, let's start there. Okay, just to clarify then, because I always ask you this, if you could explain it in layman terms. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the green areas are where they're replacing what we require. It's just a different tree or different species specimen that they're putting in there. It'll still have the coverage, the canopy. So... So this slide here shows the waiver request where you see that portion of the, um, the roundabout that mm -hmm. encroaches into where the buffer. The so the buffer is, is, the idea is that it's 25 feet free and clear of all um, built structure, right? Okay. Um, here, the road encroaches into that, but the material is still the same. And again, here, you can see this 12.7 foot encroachment. You still have, you still see the material. It's just that that dry vial needed to encroach a bit into that, that into 25 that. foot. But the tree and the canopy, the coverage will still be there. Yes, ma'am. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. And I think if that's the answer for the rest of them, the other seven that are in there, it's not that right. they're ripping them out and here's except, the grass. All, all except for um, this, this landscape waiver request. Okay. Um, given the size of the desired maturity of the oak trees um, they wanted larger spacing in order to be able to have that canopy and yeah. that shade um, in these areas they're <clears throat> they're filling in the best that they can with sable palms okay so that that this is the only area where the materials are reduced okay and then and I do understand that they need the space <clears throat> because of the root growth and everything on that but are they what size or how mature are the trees going in there now? Are they saplings and then 15 years from now we will have a canopy? Or is it, when I go to park my car there, will I be able to find shade? Okay, so that's roughly, how does that compare to once we start to see a canopy that you can park under and there's coverage? That's, that's that's a hard question to answer. No fires. It rains every year. Right. There's sunlight. Right. Roughly how, five years, you think? Okay. That was my okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions from members on council? 
Go on, on. I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item R11. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, Diane, let the record show that agenda item R11 was approved 5-0. Yes, ma'am. Agenda item R12 is a public hearing to consider application number 22-125, an application <laughs> by Urban Design Studios, and adoption of resolution number 23-12, confirming the council's action. The applicant is seeking site plan and architectural approval for a mixed-use social center consisting of 12 main buildings, three out parcel buildings, which include 460,845 square feet of residential space, which is 401 units, 516,764 square feet of retail and hotel space, 82,875 square feet of office space, and 1,154,356 thousand uh, square feet of parking structures and associated open space and landscaping for a property located on the South Boulevard, Southern Boulevard of approximately 0.27 miles uh, west of State Road 7. This is the big one. <laughs> it's the fun one. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> okay, so it, not to repeat what you just I said. I just want to say this was a this is a quasi judicial item, and everyone was already sworn. Okay. okay. Um, I won't repeat what you just um, stated, Mayor. I'll just jump right into the history. I did a history on the site. The Village Council on September 18, 2022, adopted Ordinance 1028 in order to amend the Village's comprehensive plans future land use element to add an entirely new mixed use social center land use designation. The intent of the amendment was to create a future land use designation that allows for innovative and urban mixed use developments that provide integrated, vibrant, compatible, complementary uses within a single development. The Village Council on December 15, 2022 approved Ordinance 1027, which amended the Village's zoning code to add an entirely new mixed use, mixed use social center zoning district on December 15th. Council approved a land use map amendment to designate these parcels as a mixed use social center. <clears throat> Subsequently, Village Council on January 19th, 2023, Village Council approved Ordinance 1034, signing the mixed use social center zoning district designation to these parcels. The site plan has, has been designed to achieve an innovative mixed use development that provides compatible provides compatible, balanced, and integrated land uses within a single project. The site plan includes residential, commercial, and public open space to allow for a living, working, entertainment, and a pedestrian-oriented community. The site plan is regulated by the Mixed Use Social Center Zoning District, which consists of elements of form-based code. Um, in other words, the regulations that were passed for the Mixed Use Social Center are what guides the physical form rather than the setbacks and separation of uses found in traditional zoning regulations. The site plan consists of a total of 15 multi-purpose buildings that consist of three building frontage styles. Each of these buildings meet the design guidelines for the building frontage styles as it pertains to building frontage, percentage within build two zones, percentage of ground floor pedestrian coverings, minimum building separation, ground floor tenant width, building length, floor to ceiling height, ground floor transparency, above the first floor transparency, minimum sidewalk width from frontage and percentage of arcade. You see those regulations kind of create the form of these buildings. The arcade style building contains a pedestrian covering along the face of the building supported by columns on the opposite side. This building style is intended for retail, dining, recreation, and entertainment uses. Architectural treatments include, but not limited to, recessions, projections, cornices, and other ornamental structural or architectural details shall be applied along the front and side facades of the arcade-style building. Building 3 is what's shown here, um, is in an arcade-style building. <clears throat> in the storefront-style building, the main facade of the building is near the frontage line with an at-grade entrance along public ways. The building's 
This building style is intended for retail office use on the ground floor and residential or office uses above. It has substantial glazing and sidewalk level and may include awning, arcade, canopy, or balcony that may overlap the sidewalk. This is building one. It's an arcade style building. In the storefront style building, the main facade of the building is near the frontage line and it's with the at grade entrance along the public way. Slide that. Um, pursuant to the section 2675G2 of village code requirements of recreation space, our 10 acres is what will be required for this development. Um, the applicant is proposing to fi provide five acres as private recreation, which will include the square open space, which will be open lawn for the event programming and potential uses such as yoga, frisbee, soccer, or picnicking, and will be used as a versatile and flexible space over the 1.3 acres. Also included in the recreation facilities are a dog park at the corner of Tuttle Boulevard and Erica Boulevard, a giant chest north of Building 5, an amenity deck on Building 3, rooftop consisting of clubhouse area, a pool, pickleball court, and tennis court, lounge, lobby areas, and fitness areas for Building 1, 2, 5, 6, and 10, a pavilion area, and a fire pit north of Building 4. An outdoor playground south of Building 8 and a recreation lawn east of Building 12. Also included in the proposed recreation space is a continuous 10-foot shared-use pedestrian path which meanders within the 25-foot landscape buffers along a portion of the northeastern and southern perimeter of the site as well as western edge near Building 9. The applicant is offering to pay in lieu of dedication of land to the village for eight acres of 50% of the project recreation obligation. Village Code Section 2675.4H3 allows for a fee in lieu of dedication of land, and the applicant is proposing a 320,000 square foot per acre fee in lieu of payment for the five acre recreation obligation for a total of $1,600,000. <clears throat> Village Code Section 2695.9N, Special Events and Outdoor Uses allows Village Council to approve a minor special event plan. This plan shall include the areas in which these events will occur and a description of the minor special events that, were, that will occur in these areas are concert events, child athletic events, car shows, food festivals, farmer's market, movie nights, etc. The hours of operation for this development shall be Sunday 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. Monday through Thursday, 5 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. and Saturday, 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. And given the scale of this project, as part of the site planning evaluation, uh, the applicant has provided a security plan. Um, the applicant has provided and agrees to, to roaming and uniform security guards within the project through a combination of walking, biking, golf court, cart, or motor vehicle. Two sworn deputies will also be hired and on patrol Friday, Saturday evenings and early Sunday morning. Additional sworn deputies may be hired and utilized for major events if deemed necessary by the village during the major special event approval process, which will come before council. The security program will also include installation of security camera system monitoring the high traffic volume areas throughout the parking areas, roadways, walkways, entrances, exits, parks, and other gathering areas. The um, system will also include license plate readers to track, record all vehicles entering the property. Private ones. In reviewing this petition, village staff also considered conformity with the village's zoning code pertaining to the mixed-use social center zoning district. Specifically, the proposed project meets the requirements for the mixed-use social center zoning district as it pertains to parcel size, open space, setbacks, parking requirements, landscape areas, and maximum building height. The Planning Zoning Commission considered this application on April 17th and recommended approval. Overall, and except for the landscape waiver request, the proposed site plan is in conformance with the village's requirements for the mixed-use social center zoning district, and therefore staff is recommending approval of application 22-125 with an added condition for the art and public places. The condition 
I'll read as follows. The art and public places requirements in section 2675.5 of village code must be met. The public art requirement for this project is 1% of its first $25 million. Since this single project has a total of construction cost exceeding $25 million using a certified cost estimate equivalent to $250,000, the art installation shall be in the location depicted on the site plan and installed prior to the issuance of the first certificate of occupancy. And with that being said, Mayor, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bradford. You're up, sir. So again, Bradford did a great job, so I'll supplement as I can. But just to start, again, we'll reiterate the history. This is um, something Brian's been acquiring these parcels for near 10 years now. And in 2019, we got the initial rezoning and future land use changes to the Village of Royal Palms commercial and commercial general designations. And then this past year, in 2022, we got the zoning text amendment, the comprehensive plan text amendment, the rezoning and the future land use map amendment, all to really set the stage for the site plan that you see before you tonight. Fong. Paging Fong? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> is it is it is it public is it public all the time? Yeah. All right, we're gonna go to the commercial break now. We'll be right back. guys see that yep. yes we do Great. Yes. we're back so again this is just the context of um the site as you all are familiar with at this point and just to set the stage what we're trying to do here is create this larger innovative and sustainable mixed-use district with vertical integration um, not only as a vehicle for economic and employment generation but to really create this social center that allows these mixes of these mix of uses to leverage on each other and to create this community aspect where people can interact, whether it's via work, whether it's via entertainment or living. It's just a general outline of the site data. We are consistent with the open space provided and the minimum and maximum ranges of the floor area ratios for each use type. And this is a general site plan here and the next slide here is just the outline of the proposed access into the site. The, um, well, I'll go from here, but the proposed access to the site is mainly coming off of Southern Boulevard and 441. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. <laughs> Who's changed it over? They do it right? <laughs> Hold on. In the back, yeah? Not download it. Is it downloading? It's, yeah, just like the, it keeps on going black. and it's cycling? Yeah. yeah. It's coming in. It's coming in. Yeah, okay. Let's see what this is. I'll just keep it in the um, this pane then so it doesn't have to be the download. Okay, so okay, so let me just do current slide. Alright, perfect. Yes. So the main access is gonna be coming um 
you have the access in the Erica Boulevard and off of 441, but specifically within the site, it's been designed to really have seamless connectivity uh, to each area within Pod 6. So you can see that we've designed roundabouts on two on Total Boulevard and then one on Erica to create this seamless flow to not have too much log jam and have efficient ingress and egress into the five garages provided that we can have sufficient parking for the entire site as a whole. So the regulating plans that are set forth in the previously approved MXS zoning text um, governs the plans by a series of frontage, setbacks, and open space with three building site types that uh, Bradford went over earlier, which is the storefront type, which is more meant for the at grade level retail shops um, for pedestrians to interact with. The arcade type, which is more of our entertainment style building, and then the general building type, which is going to be used uh, consistent with the existing village PCB standards. And as Bradford mentioned again, the um, way these regulating plans are set out is it creates the specific regulations, such as building frontage percentage, building length, floor to ceiling heights, that creates the picture of the type of architecture and development that you want to see as opposed to a typical zoning code where a lot of that is left open to interpretation. So this gives you a specific style which we're bringing forth in the site plan. And this is just a general graphic of how the site plan uh, use mixes within the site. And as you see, you have these residential uses on the second, third, fourth, and fifth floors with the ground floor dedicated to retail in um, these cases. And this is, again, just to reiterate the comprehensive plan text to have vertical integration, to have this mix of uses that all benefit each other. So I'm not going to go through every single detail of every building, but I'm just going to show you the general <coughs> style and the general location of each building. So building one, you're going to have 98 units, and it's going to be your storefront style. And in this chart here, you can see this shaded blue area is, as we've worked with staff, we've maintained an eight-foot clear path on all frontages. And it was really important that we were able to provide that for the comfortable pedestrian experience while walking along these storefronts. And in actually most cases, this is a 12-foot length from um, the sidewalk <coughs> to the front of the building, where when it's eight foot, it's encroached by a landscape planner that's four feet to allow extra vegetation on the site. But it was um, a thought to make sure that we provided this eight foot clear path where available on these frontages. And this is just a diagram of the glazing of the transparency of the building to really show that activity for each building. And this is a diagram specifically of how we've worked with the landscape architect to make sure that where we're placing these palm trees lines up neatly with the architectural <coughs> features. And this is a general rendering of what Building 1 will look like and that architecture proposed. And I'll point out here where my cursor is the elevated pedestrian crossing, which is really a great addition to the site plan to create seamless pedestrian connectivity between building to building. And what, real quick, sorry to interrupt, yeah, what are those two buildings? Because I saw the crosswalk earlier, and it's going from a residential, and where does it end up? Yes, there? so this right here is building one. This elevated pedestrian crossing connects to the garage eight, which is on the west side of Tuttle. But now with all the residential, do they connect to a parking <coughs> structure? Yes, or that is the only one? Is that the only pedestrian the pathway that we have? All the um, all the uh, residential units have a walkway to a garage except for one, okay. which is building seven. Okay. The rest of them are either integrated with parking or they have a walkway. Okay. So you can get where if I'm parking, I can take my groceries in. I yes. don't have to worry about the yeah. elements. I don't safety. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and, it's, and, and to be honest, it's looking like we're going to do a valet service. M most of the residents will be offered a valet service. We're going to have so much valet that we think that that this type of resident, you know, there's, if, you, if you want to live in a regular apartment, you would live in one of the other 1,200 units, right? So this is more of a <coughs> young professional home. We think these are going to have a lot of valet service. So we're going to be offering, we're pretty sure we're not 99, but we're going to have a valet service for the residential units. Yes. 
there'll be a lot of valley stuff. Going back to, he didn't touch on it there, but when he went to the um, 12 foot walkway, uh, that's the eight foot clear path, but there's 12 foot. That doesn't count the covered patio. So aren't the covered patios 10 or eight? Eight or 10? They're big. So you've got a total of 22 feet to put outdoor um, dining chairs and tables and stuff like that. So, <coughs> can, can I ask you to go back to where the, you showed the palm palm tree located along the walk area? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, one one of the things we talk about uh, is being walkable, right? Uh, in the heat of the summer here, shade is really really important. Palms usually don't give you much. Agreed, but what you're missing is the direction of the sun and the height of the buildings. The park is shaded at any time after like 3 in the afternoon. So if I want to go out earlier than that, though, I'm, 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 dealing, with, I'm dealing with what I'm talking about. <laughs> to, make it, to make it truly walkable, I mean, that, that is one of, the, one of the considerations. I assume there's a, a reason that Joel didn't go with some kind of shade canopy dense rather than a palm. Yeah, I, I think that the idea of uh, the royals is the whole thing. You know, royal palm, tuttle royale, royals on all the roads, stuff like that. Mm. Okay, so. well, again, you know, from a walkable community point of view, uh, and uh, I've been to a couple of these mixed-use developments, like up around the Orlando area, and um, they do actually have. Now, the, 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 when he went through the site plan, he I, I hope you focused on it. It's, there's almost a one-mile, 10-foot-wide walking path that's completely covered in trees that is in the perimeter of the landscape berm. So that is completely covered in trees, that one-mile walking path. It's just in the, in the center of the project. We didn't want those. Okay, one, one other uh, comment. Talking about being in a mixed-use development for real that exists. I just recently had the experience, and somebody said to me, "You know, on that <coughs> first level, that ground level, um, you, you need to be sure that if if it what the intent here is to have a storefront that provides access from the walkway, that there are doors." I said, "You got to be kidding me!" And they showed me a gym in one of these mixed-use, vertically integrated buildings, and sure enough. All it was was a glass wall. You had to go around to the side or to the back of the building to be able to get in. And I thought, well, I'm thinking that kind of defeats the whole idea. So I assume these are all accessible. All well. these have front doors accessible, and the gym has a downstairs accessible. Everything's front door accessible. Yeah, we don't have any of that either. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So. So we're like shade trees. So. Oh, and just uh, to make a comment on the shade, a lot of these um, ground floor level storefronts do offer awnings or um, coverings in front of that storefront area. So there is substantial offerings of that. And specifically for building three, the entire arcade is covered. Okay. And, all right. and, and all the restaurants will have canopies for their tables out front. They'll either have a canopy attached to the building or they'll have an individual canopy. The other thing that they went back to, um, he showed it good on one of them is the, um, the entire park is paved, except for the, the grass here. So I don't know if you've been to City Place yet where they got rid of all the curb and gutter and it's just paver. The street has come out and it's a special kind of paver for the curb, um, the gutters, and then it goes right into the parking lot. So it's all going to be completely walkable. So when we have minor special events and, and we might shut down a <coughs> section, you can push the tables a little further into the roads and you can have a more open you know, theme type. Uh, it's that flexibility that's worth Flexibility. Yeah. It's all about flexibility. Okay. All right. Thank you. And again, a lot of these, um, the style of these, the, the next following slides are just depicting the architecture in that clear eight-foot path. So building two is a similar storefront building, 98 units, and a similar style with the path offered and the architecture as we see here. Building three specifically is our arcade building, and this is our main focus as far as the entertainment. <coughs> this building includes the special exception uses that were discussed earlier tonight in regards to the comedy club, the bowling alley, and the movie theater, with a parking structure in the rear. 
And here again, you see that eight foot path and you see that separation with the parking structure and the glazed area and the associated architecture with that. And again, this is provides an arcade covering which provides shades for pedestrians within that range. And then more of the architecture. And building four is a parking garage which also has a daycare portion and the front as highlighted in this yellow. And also a portion of retail on the northern end. And one thing that we also <coughs> wanted to make sure to activate these garages is we have a, in the MXS code, there's a requirement of 25% of all of the um, ground floor funnage of parking garages have to be of a storefront style. So again, that's a further effort in making sure that these aren't just blockades of parking garage buildings, that these are getting active on the ground floor level. And that's the associated architecture. In building five, a similar concept with 47 units and parking structure in the rear. And you can see that separation and the eight foot clear path and the architecture. In building six, we have 58 residential units. And the architecture, as you guys can see here from the different points of view. Now, building seven specifically, that's the hotel portion. The hotel will have ground floor retail, and the stories above will be containing 125 keys. Um, and this will be the highest building limited to seven stories at 93 feet and four inches in height. And this will also be of the storefront style. And it still maintains that eight foot clear path. And here you could see the proposed architecture. Building eight is one of our parking garages with being consistent in 25% of the building uh, providing retail storefront. And here you could see more of that landscape imposed. And the associated architecture and that uh, elevated pedestrian crossway. So the elevated pedestrian crossway you see here is the other side of the earlier picture that was shown in building one with that elevated pedestrian crossway. So it does show that connection over to the hotel. Now building nine connect, uh, contains our special exception uses in regard to the grocery store and the fitness center. This is a general style building, so it provides, um, it's consistent with the Village of Royal Palm PCD standards and existing building types. And you could see the architecture proposed here and the landscape imposed. And then building 10, we have 100 units. And similarly to the storefront styles of building one. And similarly with uh, building 11, that's our garage in the northeastern portion of the site with 25% retail still provided. And the architecture as you can see here. And building 12 will actually contain our office square footage as far as the uh, mixes of uses in the site. Um, 82,875 square feet of this building will be contributed to the office with uh, 30,000 roughly of retail. And this will also be a storefront style building, as you can see in the architecture here. And the next three buildings are out parcel buildings. These are general frontage buildings, and um, these are also going to be sort of one story, 20. Uh, 20 foot in height buildings that are going to be fronting Southern Boulevard. Um, and Brian can speak to those uses in a bit here. But uh, just showing the proposed architecture for these square footage. And our, part, our site is sufficiently parked. Um, we are also providing sufficient bike parking per the MXS code with 120 spaces provided. And we're roughly almost 200 spaces over our parking requirement. And Bradford touched on this earlier, but with the open space in the MXS code, there is a requirement that not only do you provide 20% of the site as open space, but specifically that you have two open space types that are provided. Our open space types that we selected were the square open space type and the pocket park open space type. And really, the square is the driving force of this site plan. It is what 
the main storefront buildings are built to be oriented to. It's what's uh, the main focus of the special events that are planned. And it's really the focal point of pedestrian and community interaction. And you can see this open space placed in the center of the site. And at the corner, we do have our pocket park provided um, for the dog park. And we're also consistent with the recreation requirement at five acres, with the remaining being paid via fee in lieu. And again, I just do want to reiterate that we are providing this 10-foot undulated walking path that's nearly a mile, or even more than a mile, I think, in um, linear footage that really provides a shaded, comfortable exercise path for residents and visitors alike to be able to enjoy. But on top of that, uh, there's provisions of outdoor playground, giant chess, pavilion, fire pit, um, open lawn, and further amenities within each building. And here you could see that sort of clubhouse style on the roof of building three with a clubhouse area, pool, pickleball, and tennis courts provided. Of building three, correct, yes. And here you see the consistency other than the um, encroachments on building three and the dry valve encroachments per the landscape waivers. We are consistent with the 25 landscape, 25 foot landscape buffers to properly screen and um, buffer the site from adjacent uses. And here's our layout of the minor special event areas where we will be closing some of the roads within that open space park. And this lists out areas for um, vehicular parking for loading. Um, it calls out our multimodal transit hub, which I'll speak to in a bit here, and the general vehicular traffic to really make sure this flows seamlessly when we do have our minor special events. And again, just showing here that some of the events planned here are food trucks, movie nights, car shows, and these specific minor special events will be um, proposed really on a weekly basis to continue to provide activity for the residents to enjoy. And those major special events which do exceed those thresholds will have to come um, on a spe specific permit by permit basis. And again, just to reiterate, we really did want to commit a design the site to be a comfortable pedestrian experience to be seamless, whether it's vehicular or pedestrian, but specifically pedestrian. This, as you see in front of you, is a connectivity exhibit, which shows the expanse and the amount of sidewalk and um, elevated pedestrian crossings for pedestrians to get from parking to residential or parking to recreational offerings or parking to the square and even the pedestrian connections to the sites ex um, adjoining on the exterior of the site to be able to get to the pod to single family or the related development to the west or the apartments to the east and really just to create connectivity for users who want to interact with pod six and in this entertainment district in general. And we've provided a market study in conjunction with the requirements. And we've also had a lot of collaboration, not only with staff, but with uh, agencies outside of the Royal Palm Beach planning staff. We've received our traffic performance standards approval letter from the county. We've <coughs> coordinated with the school district of Palm Beach County. We've received our SCAD letter. Um, we're also providing a multimodal transit hub at what will be the main intersection of Tuttle Boulevard and Erica Boulevard. And here we're providing a scooter pad and a pad for bike parking for users who want to use those type of multimodal and micro mobility standards. And we're also providing a pull-in lane for ride share and pickup and drop off for those who are using Lyft and Uber who want to get from this site and get from point A to point B. And in further coordination with outside agencies, we've coordinated with Palm Tran. Um, at this moment, they actually have an existing stop on Southern Boulevard and on 441. However, we were still able to provide them two 10 by 30 easements on either side of Erica Boulevard so that if there ever is a connection in the future to Tuttle Boulevard, that they're provided in these convenient locations. And we've also been in contact with the Palm Beach County Transportation Planning Agency 
um, and in conjunction with their land use and economic development report and their future vision to have light rail on Okeechobee Boulevard in 441, um, the site plan that we're proposing with this mix of uses and with this residential density is really the type of density that they foresee in a transit stop and specifically the intersection of Southern 441 is an area that they highlighted as one of their main um, station areas. So it will connect seamlessly with the uh, proposal of Tuttle Way Out. And we've also been in contact with the school district of Palm Beach County as far as placing the bus shelter for um, the kids who will live in this community. In fact, we at first planned it for the corner of Tuttle Air and Erica Boulevard, but in conversations with the school district, we were able to provide a safer, more efficient location just south of the first roundabout, which will not only allow kids to stay away from what might be um, more traffic at that intersection, but also the um, parking area and the rear alley and the rear of the buildings, where realistically you're going to have parents who are going to sit and wait for their kids, and there's going to be some queuing there. So that takes it off of what will be the um, intersection at Tuttle and Erica Boulevard. I have a quick question about yeah, that because absolutely. I know we have uh, a school that's planned to go there, a K through 12, uh, the projected to. Correct. But until that happens, do you know where, which elementary school that zoned for? Is that in, in, is it in between Royal Palm and Wellington? So can it go to any of those two? It'll be Everglades. Okay, so it's yep. Wellington. Okay. Yep. That's the. That's the elementary. The elementary. middle school is going to be Emerald Cove, and the high school will be Palm Beach Central. So it's Coast. all those in Wellington. <clears throat> Thanks. And that really concludes my presentation. I'll let Brian say the final word. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? What hotel? What? Who's the hotel brand? Right now we're negotiating with um, <coughs> a hotel called the uh, AC brand from Hilton. Or is it Marriott? Marriott AC brand. They would do a little bigger than we first thought. They'll have 250 rooms, 225. About 125 would be quick stay and 100 be extended stay. Hmm. And then on the top floor of the hotel, half of it will be a pool for them with the glass rail overlooking the park with a, with a, with a bar and light service food. Again, they don't want to compete with the restaurants. We don't want to over-restaurant the facility. Yeah. And then the other half will be a banquet area. You know, one of the things I was selling the hotel people on is that there's nowhere to get married out west here. There's no, you know, there's oh. no. Oh. Oh. We've got a beautiful place for people to have their weddings. <laughs> <laughs> or conventions or whatever. So we'll have that. <laughs> there's limited places. Now, conventions, that's, limited. that's really Eddie. what we're looking at. That's limited. Really what we're Eddie, the yeah. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> so with with regard to you know that first mile, last mile discussion, yeah. and we're talking about the five six one TPA uh, study and, and, and plan and everything. Unfortunately, the the transit hub um, area that they've got identified right now is on the north side of State Road eighty six on Southern Boulevard. It really doesn't provide a very convenient opportunity for walking and biking and other no, ways and to get to a transit I, stop like that. That thing, so in my opinion, don't take me wrong, but that thing's 10 or 15 years down the road. By the time we're built and they see the traffic there, they'll move it. They yeah. will. I mean, All right. Just, yeah. I, just, I know we're I'll put it a different to way. There's, there was enough time to have rationalization of <laughs> these concepts. I sure. mean, I do love the tri-rail idea, and I do think it'll work, and I, I think we'd be a great stop the, for The tri-rail might start out as rapid bus service and have to, once again, rationalize to the next level. Right, so. but having that conversation sooner <clears throat> rather than later and just keeping it in the mix. No, no. We can it's, it's, talk about it. It will be a continual. Encourage a movement and shift like that just to yeah. say, to, I, I know you guys looked at the plan. Uh, and I happen to know that. I think one, unfortunate, one of the commissioners on the Village of Royal Palm Beach Commission is very into that and is going to make sure that we keep that going. Well, there are a few of us who are <laughs> kind of interested in that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm good. Okay. Do you have questions? Yeah,
Yeah, let me do the. <laughs> Diane, any advance? Public comment from you. On agenda item R12. None. Ray, any hands? Still no hands, huh? Okay. I've received no comment cards on agenda item R12. Does anyone would like to speak? Seeing none, I'm closing public comment on agenda item R12. And further comments and questions from members of the council. Go ahead. Real quick, so I have a few questions. <clears throat> But did you mention that you're doing, so what we do, we have the land dedication, and I think maybe Bradford can answer, maybe go through this. We have the land dedication, so it needs to be for a public facility for parks or a park open space open to the public. Are they doing the buyout for that? So, so what, they, what they're providing is, is so their, their requirement is for 10 acres. Right. So they're providing five acres on site of private recreation. Okay. <clears throat> And then they're buying out the other five acres, and that is where you get the one million six hundred thousand dollar contribution. So when you say that it's private, so is it five <coughs> acres that's just for? Can is it public that anyone can use it, it's, or is it, it just for their it's, residents? It's private because it's on private property. But can anyone access and utilize the facility, or? I think that's the idea that they are able to access that that area but it's just not publicly dedicated it is on private property so the I okay I that, think that's I the distinguish that that's that's the, right. that's how we distinguish between the, the pri private he has a private obligation of a half of 10 acres which right. is five acres and this is the form that it comes in it's on private land and then so the other five acres he's doing a payment in lieu of and he'll buy that and pay for the buyout right. so um to clarify then, because it's on private property, you're maintaining it, or the, the area will maintain, facilitate, put the, the items on there, but it will be open to the public, but it is not village maintained, right. monitored. Right. Okay, so we can't control what apparatus goes in there or anything right. like that. Okay, so unlike how we're doing at Belisera, we have total control of that. People can vote on what they want. So okay. now you gotta make sure that the understanding is is that the public can go to they these areas, right. but they have the right to shut it down. They, I'm sure they don't want people in that little park square area at 3 a.m. in the morning. So they wouldn't, okay, because ours, all of our parks are set up sundown. Right. And they're saying it's because it's on private property. Right. They can then regulate right. hours of operation. Correct. They write, okay, so it is open to the public, right. but we have no control over right. it. As and far and as, okay. they'll, they'll probably have loitering provisions. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's like, you know, we have in our parks. Right. All right. So that I understand. So you're... I would never say you have no control over anything. <laughs> just... <laughs> you just tell me all the time when you stand <laughs> up. So just so I understand, though. But it is open. People can use it. But you are designing it. You are maintaining it. You are regulating it. It's all that. Okay. Um, the other one is special event permits. Or you do... Because it is private land. So if you if they're doing for right now anyone does a car show or whatever they come in for a, a, an event permit will they need will anything happening in that property come into us for an event permit or does it all private because it's handled for them? so the way that we set up the regulations for the mixed use social center is that we wanted to identify two types of special event permits one is the minor special event permit mm -hmm. that can be approved as part of the site planning process um, which I touched upon that. A, a bit in yeah. my presentation you know there's the car show right. the minimal closing of roadways in order to create that safe environment for parents that have young kids yep. or you know for what a safe environment for everyone yep. right uh, where they there is not the pedestrian vehicular interactions now <clears throat> the other one is is the larger uh, special events where they may close down more of the main roads say it's a um, 5k mm -hmm. right um, those types of events will come before council for your approval. Okay, so the smaller ones don't. Correct. And then, and yes, like a movie I know night the, on you know Friday night. Yeah, yeah right. and that's one of the things. And one of the questions that we ask is: Is it you know prohibited? Do you need to close roads? Is there safety? So all the standard questions they would have to meet those standards, but they don't have to come to us right. for, for approval on that. It's for, for the, the minor level. ones. Yeah. And then as part of that, we also evaluated. Um, Parking. Yeah. You know, okay. Who's closed um, during these times where you would have these more ma you know, minor events, but it's different than the way that the center operates generally. Right. 
um, and then make sure that those were able to be parked. Now, these major events, they'll, they'll have a more, um, their, their parking requirement um, for these more major events will, you know, you'll need more parking spaces. And so how do we accommodate for that? And so those are the types of evaluations that we'll take into consideration whenever we evaluate, make recommendations for these more major events. Okay. And you have five parking structures on the property. Yeah, we have we have a total of 3,400 parking Spaces. spots, okay. which is a lot. And we didn't ask for any waiver in that because um, one of the things we did in designing the center was, you know, I sent my uh, kids to all the different centers in the United States. They went to the Grove, they went to Kierland Park, they went to Commons, they went to, you know. And one of the main things is, and Ryan worked for City Place, and the big thing they beat the hell out of me about is experience. If the experience is good, people will come back. If the experience stinks, they won't come back. And City Place at its heyday would run out of parking spots. Now, who's going to drive all the way there and there's no parking spots? And so you're not going to do that twice. I mean, you might do it twice, but you definitely ain't doing it a third time. So we have a lot of parking spots, and we, we feel comfortable but we have some safety plans that if we're more successful than we think, then we may come back to you and change a building usage to be a parking garage. We may need to do that. We may buy some other land and park there. But for now, we feel very comfortable until we get going. So that the other thing that, that to keep in mind is because you don't have anything like this, when we do a major event, I think a, an example, because there was a lot of debate on this, in, in good debate. Um, a major event will be a Christmas tree lighting ceremony. Now, we're going to get 20,000 people there. So where do you park them? Well, you have to park them at the fairgrounds, and you have to shuttle them over. So how do you notify them of that? Well, you got to put up temporary signs to tell people. But your code doesn't allow temporary signs, flashing signs, to do that. So there's all these little things we have to work out over the next couple of years Remember, you know, if we start construction in August, we're two years from opening. So we have time to work out these details. So that's why we said on major events, we'll come back with a plan and code changes we need so that we can, you know, direct people to park at the fairgrounds or park somewhere else and we'll have shuttles to bring them over and stuff like that. Uh, and the fair did that where they directed, they ran PSAs and commercials and everything, go park at Wellington Mall and we're going to bus you over to the fair. So there's ways of letting the public know. And then we also talked about that with parking structures uh, and parking fees versus non-paid parking. So we talked about that right now you don't anticipate charging for parking in the parking structures. We have, you know, everything is very, very fluid right now with the construction cost and the interest rates. I mean, our construction loans, when we started looking at this a year ago, were at 6 and 7%. Now they're at 11 and 12%. So there's a lot of stuff in fluctuation. Uh, we're we're going to be using Frinfrock garages. They specialize. All they do is build garages. They, and, in fact, they just built a plant in Belvay. They hire local people. It's a big contract. It's a $60 million contract. And um, they're experts at it. And they're going to have the signs that say how many spots are open on each floor, right? Stuff like that. So you'll be able to drive in and you'll see which floor has open spots on it. Plus, if you study the, the design, you know, some of the waivers we got is so that we can, on each garage, we'll have four lanes in. Every garage has four lanes. So at night, coming in, you can have three going in and one out. And then late at night, you can switch over and have three going out and one in. Because the worst thing you want to do is, is, is be in a line in a garage to get out. I've been there. I hate it. So we designed every, we tried to design everything we could think of to make the experience good. Thanks. All about the experience. My last question, do you have an estimated time when you think Erica Boulevard will be operational and the light will be active? <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a lot you of questions that I hear. That question. Just I an said, estimate. I sent an email to Ray on that today. The, the hold up today is FPNL. Okay. FPNL has got to drop a transformer right. to power the lights. The lights are in. They're ready. Mm -hmm. We've got to get FPNL to drop a transformer to turn them on. Once they're on, they have to flash for 90 days okay. per the FDOT code before they can be Active. signalized. 
So unfortunately, before the lights are operational, we're looking at four months, five months. Now, the intersection will be ready to be open in 30 days. So right, left. that road, because right now it's still closed. Yeah, and it doesn't even have the, the first layer down. So I just want to make sure I Right, right. So within, they're doing sidewalks, yeah. street lights start Monday. Okay. They're going to mill. And within 30 days, it will be milled, asphalted, and ready to open. And then we're just going to work with Chris and Ray, and we're going to come up with an MOT that simulates what the, the intersection was before we did the work, which people are used to, right? You could turn left in one yeah. lane. So we'll have to block off some lanes, but we think we can get it open with support, you know, within 30 days, and then the lights will be another. You can take your time on the lights. I was just asking because then it's easy to cut through to go in from one side to the other. So yes. that was my main question. Okay. Thank you. Lowe's is reminding me daily. About that. About that. Okay. Really? I cursed your name today when I tried to cross over. <laughs> yes, <it's laughs> so the manager of Lowe's walked out to my son. I, I wasn't there. And he says, so oh, my sales are down $60,000 yeah. in three days. What do I tell corporate? <laughs> One question that uh, came to mind, we were talking about the hours of operation of this uh, five-acre uh, recreation area located on private property. Is there going to be a POA? How, how, is, how are the rules of the road going to actually be put in place for uh, the kinds of things that an HOA and a POA does? Well, there's a master association that runs the Erica and Tuttle and the okay. drainage areas. All right, so that, that's the group that would actually put in place something that we would then also be coordinated with, right? No. That is for Erica and Tuttle okay. to maintain the roads, the landscaping, and the drainage. Because <clears throat> okay. there's some pr public road and some private, right? So the road had to be public to get to the park, but the rest of the road is private. Then within, within Main Street, there'll be a POA that manages Pod 6 alone. All right, that, that was my question. And back to, and we would be coordinated oh, with on of course. that activity, which would take care of some of the questions about operations, about access, about maintenance responsibilities, all those wonderful details, right? I, th I think that, you know, this is going to be a very interactive with the city. We are not going to be harbor side. We're not going to be in the newspaper arguing about lights and noise. And we're not doing that. There's no win in that. So it's all going to be interactive. And I think, you know, I was going to get to this later. Nine years I've been here interacting. I think that you can trust I'll work it out with you. It's been nine years, huh? It's been nine years. Time wow. flies when sure you're interacting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while Thank ago. You. Okay. Any no other more comments? questions? Questions? Member on council? No? If there are none. All right. Before we go, you I want to say something. I want to summarize. <laughs> We're not getting out of here this early. Not after nine years. I got a two-hour speech ready. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> no, at first, I want to. I want to say a couple things. Number one, nine years ago, we started buying the land, and, and if you remember, Ray was around. Some of you were around. It was originally going to be Hughes Development. 45 homes and a single lane bridge back before the crash. And then I bought that land and we bought the next land and we bought the next land and we just kept adding and the vision kept changing. And then I'm sure you remember about six years ago we wanted to either go to Wellington or Royal Palm and we decided to come to Royal Palm but there were some holdouts so we had to have a special election and Florida Crystals helped set that up and we had a special election to get the land moved in here. Then we continued to get it entitled, and then we got it all entitled, got the commercial center done three, three and a half years ago, went to market, and everyone laughed at us, and COVID hit, and it completely changed retail. So then we had to go back to the drawing board, and through all this, you guys have worked with us, because you, you, you worked with us, you helped us rechange the code, you rewrite the code, you, you believe the dream. I want to. I want to thank the. You know, I got all my consultants here. They've all been working on this five years. The engineers, the land planners, the traffic engineers. Ten years. They've just been doing it. Just, I really appreciate it. And you know, I, I want to throw a shout out to uh, Ray and uh, Chris and 
Bradford and everybody in staff because we didn't always agree, but we agreed to keep working at it. That was, you know, you don't, you don't always agree, but you agree you have to get to the goal. And this process of the expedited um, DRC process worked out very well for us. Ray said a year ago, and it didn't sink in then, but it sunk in the last month or so. Literally within a year, we rewrote the code, voted on the code, redid comp plans, land use change, site plans, did everything. And, and I think it's a little less than a year since when it started. So it has been a very, very, very quick turnaround. It's all worked out well. And, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get this built. We, we, we feel confident about it. Like I said, we've been, got some letters from banks. We're negotiating with some uh, big equity partners. This is a big lift. It's $500 million. It's too big for me. So I've got to bring in a partner, a, a big partner. And my challenge with them will be to maintain enough control to protect me and the village on what the dream is that we have. You know, because the last thing I want to do is bring in some big REIT that wants to go back and economize everything. So, again, I just want to thank everybody. I'm very pleased with the way things turned out. I'm very pleased with the staff. We're going to go over to Carabas and have a few drinks. You're welcome to come over and uh, <laughs> that's a night out on the town in Royal Palm today. But in a few years, that won't be. <laughs> think about that. I'm actually going to build a home in pod four. I'm going to combine three lots and build a, a nice house there. I haven't told anyone yet. I've told my kids, and I'm probably going to build, you know, it's a 100 single family homes, so I'm going to combine three for a nice house for me, and then I'm going to build some houses for the kids. Because we, we intend this to be a legacy. I mean, I hope you like me, because I ain't going <laughs> We're here, and... Um, you know, and, and on that, you know, Erica, we're, we're making great progress. We're starting the lights. I took whoever wanted to go on a tour on a tour if you could make it. Lights are going in next week. Sidewalk started. If you go out there next week, you'll say, wow, look at that sidewalk. It's pretty cool for a sidewalk. We're going to be starting the landscape soon. The irrigation's already going in, so that's going good. On my pod that I'm keeping for the apartments, we're pouring our first slab tomorrow. Rob Hill has been... I, I like Rob. He's just a good guy. He's good to work with. He's helpful. He's tough. But, you know, everything's moving along there. and Everything's everything's good right now. I got no problem. <coughs> oh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, look at me. I'm 28. Look what this job has done to me. <laughs> No, it's going to be great. I mean, it's it's going to be a world class. Think of this. You go in there. There's cheesecake. There's Tommy Bahamas. There's um, the Lulu for the women. The women. This will be the fashion center of Central Palm Beach County, right? You can either go to Boca or PGA or here, because every other store will be here. And then we'll have all the restaurants, the cool restaurants. You can go out on Tuesday night, walk around. There'll be concerts. There'll be the the fountain thing with the kids running around and stuff. I just think it's going to be so cool. And think about the population that just drives by it, that can stop there now. 275,000 people drive by it a day. They don't have to drive anymore. They can just pull in there. So um, I think it's, and, and I can tell you this, every tenant I take out there, every, every investor, every bank, they sit back and they go, wow, this, this, this works. Because every job has a but. I, I don't know if you guys have seen Dania Point. It's one of the newer centers. It's great, but you can't get there. You've got to drive through some crappy areas to get in there. Yeah. City Place is great, but it's in a high crime area, right? There's no but here. There's no high crime. There's great demographics. It's got three access points, good access points. Six lane roads, lights, everything works. So we're very happy. It's Royal Palm Beach. And now you do too. So again, thank you for everything. We appreciate it. I appreciate staff and um, we're very pleased. And just like you believed in me for eight years, believe me, I'll get this built somehow. I'll get it built. 
Well, certainly this is a milestone in its initiative, and it's been a number of years, but uh, uh, I think everybody's worked together on both sides of, of the equation here, and, and uh, I think that's what got things to where they are. Remember, you know, remember we first had the first conversation, and we said to you, we have to write a whole new yes. uh, ordinance, and, 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 and we worked through all of that, right? We got, you know, uh, it's funny, we were arguing about how long it was going to take at first, you know, what you were concerned about, but it, it we're, you're at a major milestone, and congratulations on that. Keep up the momentum. Let's continue to continue working together, because um, I think we're all very excited what we're looking at the outcomes to be. And I think the residents can't wait are for thank you. Yeah. I really believe that the day will come and they'll go. This is really well, what we need. Well, listen, I've had I don't know hundreds of conversations, maybe more than hundreds, over these last several years with your project. And uh, I've always put it in the context that I remind people that once upon a time, we didn't have a Carabas in the village, all right? That whole center over there. And I remind them, remember yet, if you wanted to go to Carabas, you'd go down to Palm Beach Lakes, right? And they go, yeah, that's right. I said, well, now we're moving to another level. All of the entertainment venue things you want to do with your family, it'll be right here. But it'll be on the outskirts of the village. It's not in the core of the village. And I think that's still the, you know, key points to always point out to people that, when this is done, they're going to realize, wow, this is just right here, and, and you know, it doesn't encroach on my street where I live. I can just it doesn't go affect out there. anyone who lives yeah. around here or anything. And else. that's because you made the right decision when you were determining should you annex into Wellington or should you <laughs> annex into Royal Palm. Remember that conversation we had? <laughs> I, uh, I I couldn't agree more that that was, you know, and the, I tease people. I go, I'm so the day we will no longer be Wellington's little brother. People will go, isn't that in Wellington? <laughs> yeah, I, I get so mad when they say that. I go, no, it's Royal Palm Beach. It's better. So, so. Better. We don't say better. We say different. All right. Yeah. We're humble. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great job. Are we, are we ready for a motion now? Sure. Look for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve regular agenda item number 12. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Diane, we have no opposed. Let the uh, record show that agenda item R12 was approved 5-0. And once again, congratulations. Okay. <clears throat> agenda item R13 is a public hearing for a second reading. An adoption of ordinance number 1018, amending chapter 26, zoning at section 26-22, definitions. To modify an existing definition and add three entirely new definitions, and at section 26-57, uh, accessory uses, building structures, model homes, setback regulations for sheds and place structures with design features. Exceeding eight feet in height and additional regulations for sheds. What is that? Okay. Uh, Section 26-57. Oh, did he fall on the floor? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exceeding eight feet in height and additional regulations for sheds, accessory structures over 150 square feet, and detached private garages. You are on, sir. You are. Ready? Oh, you guys, it's Can you guys hear me out there? Oh, now we can hear you. Hi, this is Rob Hill, your community development director. <laughs> <laughs> Live from Hibiscus Drive. Hi. Um, anyway, uh, obviously, this is our second reading, and you can see what we've tried to do is provide some, some clarifications with some of the definitions. Uh, regarding shipping containers and also we provided uh, more guidelines of what a bona fide detached garage is actually going to be uh, with the minimum of 10 by 20 uh, measured from the inside and then you'll see down here uh, as you well know that uh, uh, code enforcement uh, driveways and sheds are always good for business so we've kind of identified that a shed is something that's 150 square feet or smaller um, and we encourage those throughout uh, throughout the village to help people with their storage needs. Um, what you'll see is on the next page, on page three, uh, you know, in the second reading, 
uh, that we required uh, any accessory structures that are over the 150 square feet to incorporate some of the architectural styles of the principal structure. Over on page four, you'll see the, the shipping. You'll see the shipping containers uh, are, have been identified as only allowed to be used on temporary, you know, kind of construction purposes, uh, and otherwise prohibited for any kind of accessory use. And we've also kind of specified where, while you are going to permit a bona fide detached uh, rear garage, that you uh, are allowed to then park any vehicle that would potentially fit in that garage on that driveway uh, to that detached garage, similar to what's allowed right now. Now, what is clarified is that we wouldn't allow any boats or buses or campers to be parked on there that would not fit into that garage. Um, and then uh, and along, those, along those same lines, uh, any rear improved surfaces would have to meet the uh, setback for the primary structure. Are there any questions on anything? Nope, I don't think we have any questions. Um, and with that said, this is the second meeting. Uh, I'll just ask Diane any advance. No comments. Request on agenda item R R13. Ray, any hands raised? No, nope, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I have not received any comment cards on this agenda item, and since there's no one here, I'm going to close public comment to agenda item R13 and look for a motion. Make a motion to approve the trigger agenda item 13. Second. We have a, mo we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. I let the record show agenda item R13 was approved 5-0. Agenda item R14 is an appointment of three residents to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And I believe that would be you. It yeah. is. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I move to reappoint David Leland to a regular seat with a term expiring in 2026. And move and appoint Lauren McClellan, who currently serves as alternate number one, to the vacant regular seat with term expiring in 2024. And move and appoint Kara Kauser, who currently serves as alternate number two, to the alternate one number one seat expiring in 2025. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. I am let the record show that agenda item 14 appointments were approved 5 0. Agenda item R15 is appointment of six residents to the Recreation Advisory Board. Council is on. Yeah. Hello. All right, so um, not only are we doing that, but we had, what we realized is it was many, many years, so thank you, Mitty and Diane, for helping out with this, is that all the terms expired at the same time. How did that happen? I don't know. This is, they went back, Diane went back, I think, 10, 12 years, and we figured this out. It never was an issue because there was a lot of reappointment or very little movement, yeah. so we were able to shift it now. So what we're going to do is, in addition to making appointments, is we're also going to assign um, seat terms, so it'll go on so an alternate staggered. schedule, correct. Okay. So I make a motion to move to appoint Sean Fitzpatrick to a regular seat for a one-year term expiring in 2024 and reappointing Dennis Siebert and John Rodorian to a regular seat for a one-year term expiring in 2024. And also to I move to appoint, or with that, appoint Timothy Krutz and Barry Sarkisian to a regular seat and Alfred DePaolo to the alternate seat for a two-year term. Those three will do a two-year term and expiring in 2025. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the record show. Agenda item R15 and appointments will approve 5-0. Agenda item R16 is the appointment of three residents to the Education Advisory Board. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to reappoint Kathleen Greer and Aaron Franklin to regular seats with terms expiring 2025. Uh, and I move and appoint to appoint uh, Paula Wilson, who currently serves as alternate number one, to the regular seat with the term ending in 2025, and to appoint a new member, uh, Dolores Robinson to the alternate seat number one with the term ending in 2024. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the record show that agenda item R16 was approved 5 0. With no further business before the council this evening, thank you all. We are adjourned.